it's it's a part of our uh, practitioners knowledge building series and today we on the day of world menstrual hygiene day 2023 we are going to discuss the issues of managing disposable sanitary napkins uh, which is an urgent need today and to discuss this matter we have two experts with us uh, dr arundhati uh, murli dharan who is the founder of mhai formerly known as the uh, the menstrual hygiene uh, alliance india and also we have uh, ms devika uh, Jaisal, she is the consultant menstrual hygiene and waste management and the founder of MH Square, which is Menstrual Hygiene Hub. Uh, but before we uh, uh, dive deep in this topic and talk about this issue with the, and hear from the experts, I would like to brief you about why are we discussing this so we all are aware. Uh, the theme for uh, this year's Menstrual Hygiene uh, Day 2023 is to make menstruation a normal fact of life by 2030. Uh, everyone should have access to safe menstrual products. And the main objective here is to make sure that nobody is held behind because of the fact that they menstruate. Uh, but we strongly believe that uh, uh, menstrual awareness also comes with certain uh, sort of uh, environmental consciousness. So when we talk about menstrual awareness, uh, safe menstrual products, we should also talk about how to uh, transition from disposable sanitary pads to greener option and how to make uh, menstruation uh, more greener and eco-friendlier in terms of the impact it is causing to the environment and so that it can cause least practicable impact on the environment. Uh, as we uh, we are also aware about the uh, issue of disposable sanitary napkin uh, disposal, uh, which is uh, coming across as an emerging environmental issue uh, in the country. And uh, why? Because of the fact that it is made up of plastics. A lot of plastic is used in the manufacturing process, which is non-biodegradable in nature. It takes uh, years and you know uh, thousands of years to completely degrade it. And uh, it can have several short-term and long-term environmental as well as health hazards. Then uh, the other issue is the, the this the impact is even more pronounced. Why? Because uh, many cities and villages across the country is still struggling to attain source segregation. There is poor level of uh, uh, collection, community collection, and also inefficient transportation networks across the cities and uh, uh, the villages. Uh, the other issue uh, with the management of sanitary waste, including this uh, disposable sanitary napkins, has always been its categorization. Whether we should call it, whether we should call it a plastic waste or biomedical waste, should be governed under solid waste management rules. Uh, what is the scenario? So typically, the soil napkins are, uh, which is generated from the households, uh, are governed under the solid waste management rules 2016. Uh, the segregation part, the transportation part, uh, collection part is it is the responsibilities of the city to ensure that is segregated and collected and transported in a proper manner. And then, uh, if we go uh, as per this biomedical waste management rules 2016, anything which is contaminated with uh, blood or bodily fluid should be considered as uh, biomedical waste and should be treated as per the uh, uh, specifications given in the biomedical waste uh, uh, rules 2016. That means in order to destroy the pathogens, it's, it, uh, it is required to be thermally treated, uh, preferably by incineration method. So yes, there is an overlapping of these two regulations uh, when we talk about the management strategies, which makes the uh, management and disposal even more complicated. So this particular waste stream has not been given adequate attention in the past. And as a result, we do not know how much waste, uh, sanitary waste and how much uh, uh, san disposable sanitary pads we are generating. Uh, there is one study done by MHAI, which estimated that out of uh, 336 million menstruating women and girl, 36% uh, are using uh, sanitary pads. And if we assume that they're using eight sanitary uh, pads per cycle, that, that means one billion uh, sanitary napkin waste is generated in a month and 12 uh, billion sanitary uh, napkins are generated, soil sanitary napkins are generated in a year. So this, if you look at the magnitude of problem, it is huge. And if we talk about the quantum versus volume, it is voluminous in nature and we all know that. Uh, if we talk about the city-wise waste generation, we do not have any information on that, like how much is generated by each of the cities. But there is one study which is done by Swaksh Pune, one of the uh, one of the largest waste pickers cooperatives in the country, and this is based on scientific methodology. And according to which, uh, as we can see, three percent of the total MSW which is generated in Pune city is actually 
uh, sanitary waste, uh, which is mainly comprising of uh, sanitary pads and diapers. And out of the total dry waste, which is generated in the city, 12% is actually the sanitary waste comprising of diapers and pads. So uh, now what is problematic about these uh, disposable sanitary pads and how it affects the choice of treatment technology? Uh, for that, we need to understand what are the layers in a conventional sanitary pads. Uh, as you can see in this slide, the top layer is perforated plastic, which is uh, consist of which consists of polyethylene and polypropylene, again plastics, synthetic chemicals, uh, artificial perfumes, heavy metal dyes. Then there is a transfer layer, which is synthetic fibers or cellulose-based pulp. And then the most critical and essential layer in conventional uh, uh, sanitary pads is the sodium, uh, sodium polyacrylate, or which is also known as super absorbent polymer or water lock because it has the ability to absorb 100 to 1000 um, uh, of its mass in water. Adhesives, there is polyurethane based hot melt glue, then bottom layer, petrochemical based polyethylene, which is PE, plastic, and the release paper. So what is important here is to understand that around 90% of the conventional sanitary pad is actually nothing but plastics. So what is the fate of disposable sanitary pads in India? What we are doing with the uh, soil sanitary uh, pads in the, in the country. Uh, so there is one study by Menstrual Hygiene um, Management Water Ed 2019, uh, which reported that around 45% of the use, 45% uh, uh, of the women, and menstruating women and girls are using routine waste disposal methods or uh, dustbins. So basically what we are doing is we are not segregating the waste at the source, sanitary waste, and we are just dumping it with the regular waste, MSW, uh, other fractions of the waste like wet waste, dry waste. And it ends up, because since it is in mixed form, it ends up into the dump sites or the landfills. 23% of the menstruating women and girls, they throw away in open spaces, drains, river wells, lakes or road sites. 15% dispose it by uh, burning, 25% dispose of by burning, and then the rest of 9% throw it in toilets by flushing or pit, in, uh, or pit lettering. So basically all of these uh, methods of uh, disposal, or I would not say disposal because it's not scientific, it is contaminating the entire environment and it's not sustainable at all. Uh, now, how it should be done? So in a typical city, uh, first of all, when the waste is generated, as per the solid waste management rule, 2016 it has to be segregated in three fractions, minimum three fractions. However, the Swachh Bharat Mission 2.0 uh, uh, operational guidelines suggest that it has to be segregated into four forms, uh, wet waste, dry waste, domestic hazardous waste, and sanitary waste. Then for collection of these waste, there has to be a compartmentalized vehicle, like uh, if we go uh, see, if we see in Indore, also in Bhopal, uh, in um, uh, Surat, Karad, all these places where source segregation is happening, they have made sure that they have compartmentalized vehicles to collect these, uh, these waste streams. Once it is in segregated form and if it is transported in uh, segregated form, it becomes easy for the city to channelize the waste fractions into different recycling industry. For instance, the wet waste can be subjected to uh, uh, biomethanation or composting. The dry waste can go to the various uh, recycling facilities and sanitary waste can be channelized to the biomedical waste incinerator plants where the complete 100% combustion can happen uh, leading to an uh, efficient disposal of the sanitary waste. Similarly, the domestic hazardous waste can also be channelized to common hazardous waste treatment storage and disposal facilities. Uh, now, what are the available treatment uh, options as per the CPCB guidelines? Uh, these are low cost, locally made incinerators, electric incinerators, high temperature incinerators, deep burial composting, pit burning, etc., which are prescribed by CPCB. Uh, I think this will be uh, discussed by Dr. Arundhati in the next session, so I'm not going into details. Uh, but what is important here uh, and what I want to highlight here is the fact that the commercial napkins with plastics and liners, uh, the recommended method is a good quality incinerator. When I say a good quality incinerator, it's, it's basically the centralized incinerator plants where the temperature range is such that it ensures that there is complete destruction of the of the waste. 
Uh, and why? Because the impact of incomplete burning of disposable sanit sanitary napkins is huge. First of all, it produces dioxin furan if it is burned at low temperature. Incomplete combustion of organic compounds in waste uh, feed, feed stream produces some uh, carbon monoxide. It can also produce uh, hydrogen chloride and oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, uh, metal oxides from compounds of some metals and metal va vapors, etc. Uh, so the way forward would be, uh, first of all, IEC, DCC, information, education and communication and behavioral change campaigns for waste management. Uh, I think it is extremely important and we will get to hear it, uh, about the importance of IEC, DCC and capacity building and why it is important to collaborate with self-help groups or social enterprises or NGO uh, from our uh, second uh, speaker who is uh, Ms. Devika Jeshal and she will share the success story how Kerala and one of the village in Kerala, uh, because of these initiatives, became uh, free from plastic disposable sanitary pads. Uh, then redesigning infrastructure and, uh, and services for sanitary waste management, develop mechanism for scientific disposal. So we have to see which technology is appropriate. We will get to hear more uh, about this uh, by uh, Dr. Arundhati. And uh, invite entrepreneurs showcasing novel technologies, interventions from uh, for sanitary pads disposal. So presently, we are only talking about disposal. We should start talking about recycling mechanisms also. For for instance, we have uh, mechanical, chemo-mechanical treatment technology, which is a combination of mechanical as well as chemical technology and can help us to uh, recycle the sanitary pads. But at the same time, we have to develop standards and then there has to be some policy interventions required in order to ensure that the recyclables, the product that we are getting, after recycling is free from any uh, sort of contamination, any sort of pathogens, etc. Uh, these are some of the posters which are used uh, by Swaksh uh, uh, Women Waste Pickers Cooperative in Pune in order to sensitize the women to segregate the waste at the source itself. And uh, at State Pollution Control Board level, I think this is extremely important, their intervention. So they need to develop monitoring protocols at regular intervals, especially for small scale incinerator plants. So the small scale incinerator plant uh, is gaining a lot of movement momentum uh, in the past few years uh, because uh, the government see it as one of the very good option for disposal and destruction of, uh, of the sanitary pads. But at the same time, it comes with a lot of environmental challenges. So first of all, we need to have proper monitoring of these small scale incinerators. We need to ensure that the burning of sanitary pads is happening at high temperature uh, around 900 to um, at least more than it should be more than 850 degrees Celsius, uh, develop certification system based on the performance for small scale incinerators. So with this, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Arundhati to talk about the disposal methods that are available for cities as well as for the villages. Let me unshare my screen. And before I invite Dr. Arundhati, I would like to introduce uh, her with all of you. Uh, Dr. Arundhati Murli Dharan is a public health professional with close to two decades of experience in public health programs, research and policy advocacy. She has worked on several pressing public health issues, including HIV AIDS, sexual and reproductive health and rights, universal health coverage in India, social determinants of health with a focus on water, sanitation and hygiene. She's a passionate advocate of menstrual health and works globally uh, as well as in India to build and strengthen the menstrual health ecosystem through knowledge sharing, evidence generation, policy advocacy, financing and in, in, innovations. Dr. Arundhati is a founder of MHAI, uh, as I already mentioned, an ecosystem enabler for menstrual health in India and the coordinator of the Global Menstrual Collective, a global advocacy network. She has a doctorate in public health from Boston University and master's in medical and psychiatric uh, social work from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. With this, uh, so we are very glad to have you here, Dr. Arundhati. And with this, I would request you to proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Richa, for inviting me to be a part of this, uh, this uh, important forum. And especially since we have a lot of um, uh, participants who are representing 
um, ULBs uh, and who are very closely working on this issue of, of waste in general. Um, so uh, as, as Dr. Richard said, I, I want to set, shed some light on what we know about what's happening in India and some very practical approaches uh, or solutions that we've been trying to take across various states on how to tackle the pressing issue of menstrual waste management. Um, Okay, um, so just to go a step back as to why we're looking at this, I think Dr. Richa already highlighted the number of, uh, you know, menstruators or people who menstruate we have in India. You know, if you look at the data from the National Family Health Survey, we see that over the past five to six years, from 2015 to 2020, we've seen quite a jump in the use of uh, so-called hygienic menstrual products, mostly uh, disposable sanitary pads. Now, here we see that um, the blue bars are NFHS4, which was done in 2015, 2016, and the green bars are NFHS5 that was done 2019 to 2021. Now, we see that the jump in the number of uh, people uh, ages 15 to 24 who are using sanitary pads has been far more significant in rural areas as a result of a lot of good government initiatives, as well as the work of NGOs to provide menstrual products uh, more easily uh, to people who are menstruating. Now, so while overall the picture is good that more people have access uh, to better menstrual products, it is also a bit concerning that a majority of the menstrual products that are being provided are disposable sanitary pads. And as Dr. Richa pointed out, they're um, you know, 85 to 90% uh, plastic. Now, just about um, one to two months ago, the Supreme Court gave a directive that all states and the center should have uh, uh, should uh, actively work on their uh, menstrual hygiene policies. And uh, all three major recommendations, which is providing sanitary pads, ensuring separate toilets, and uh, providing all the associated uh, requirements such as uh, you know operations and maintenance support as well as awareness programs these are also really critical for us to think about from a product and a waste management lens um, we often forget um, that the usage of products is intimately tied with waste management so um, if we're using or if we're promoting primarily disposable sanitary pads of a particular type that has huge implications for the types of solutions that we can look at so we cannot look at these two things in isolation as dr richard pointed out they're very deeply interconnected. Um, I won't go into this because Dr. Richard has already covered this. Now, um, I've been looking into waste, menstrual waste management for a while now. And when we're looking at how to address this particular issue, I see it in, uh, in three kind of interconnected blocks. One is to look at the existing policies and regulations that we have. The solid waste management rules of 2016, the biomedical waste management rules, um, the quality standards that we have for uh, centralized incineration facilities, whether hazardous or biomedical waste incinerators by CPCB. We also have standards for disposable uh, sanitary pads by the Bureau of Indian Standards. And we now also have standards for reusable cloth uh, pads by uh, the Bureau of Indian Standards. So we need to look at that and what it says about the composition of pads. Um, now, the second level that we really need to look at is what are those, that is that available basket of solutions um, for addressing uh, the management of menstrual waste right from the time that an individual user discards the product to its end of life treatment in a way that is safe for the individual communities as well as the environment around us. And lastly, it's important, given that many of us are working with government and in government, that we look at integration of menstrual waste management within the ongoing systems and not to treat this separately. But if we're looking at solid waste management rules or ULBs may have their own bylaws, et cetera, the how can we integrate it within that? So it's, it's a part of a larger system that's working in urban as well as in rural areas. Um, so I won't go into the regulatory frameworks um, because many of you know it and, and Dr. Richa has also highlighted it. I'm going to jump into the solutions here. And we're quite lucky in India that we're actually one of the countries that's quite forward looking and quite experimental when we're looking at solutions for menstrual waste. However, um, I feel that this area of work has really lagged behind as compared to other areas where we've seen far more significant progress when we're looking at menstrual health and hygiene. We have a far richer product landscape. Um, we do have a lot of awareness uh, generation programs that are happening, but the rate at which we're seeing innovation and scale up 
of um, essential solutions for menstrual waste, that's lagging behind. So it's time for us to really kick this up and see what we can do. I'm going to provide you with a, an overview of solutions here. Um, now, at, a lot of this is borrowed from the solid waste field and what we've learned from there. And one of the one of the uh, you know core principles of from solid waste is reduce the amount of waste that we've generated. So I won't go into this, but this applies um, also to menstrual waste, that if we are concerned with it, we can also look at reducing the waste volume, which means that we can look at the use of menstrual products that, um, that can be reused, so therefore we're using fewer of them, or products that lend themselves to far better disposal because of its components. But I won't go into this because my colleague Devika will be dwelling more into this and sharing some good practices. Um, the next, which, uh, next two points, which I think that are absolutely critical, but we again tend to overlook, is the immediate disposal of used menstrual products, whether it's in dustbins or disposal shoots, uh, by individuals who are using them and ensuring that this waste is collected in a segregated manner, and then that downstream processing also takes into consideration the segregated waste. Um, the biggest solution that we have right now are solutions that look at transforming menstrual waste. And by this, it's, we completely change the, the, the form of that waste. Uh, and for this, we have combustion-based solutions, uh, which, are, um, which are the most popular. So we're looking at different types of incinerators or burning chambers. Um, and um, we also have composting or deep burial solutions, which can also be looked at. Um, that the sterilization of waste is something that is very much in experimental stages. We, this involves usage of chemical treatments and certain kind of auto autoclaves or autoclaving type technologies that will make the product inert, that is to kill, uh, to make it pathogen free as we then prepare it for downstream management of that waste. Um, we have made progress in, for recycling of waste, especially with some new solutions that have come up in the form of fat care labs. And as Dr. Richa pointed out, irrespective of whichever solution or solutions we go for, creating awareness, making sure that we're doing education um, is absolutely critical as we follow through the entire waste value chain. Um, now, one thing which I have been contending with more as I work with state governments is two options. When we're looking at menstrual waste management, we need to have on-site solutions, and we may also want to consider off-site solutions. So on-site is where that waste is generated. Are there mechanisms or solutions that enable us to treat it then and there? And then for off-site is we are able to collect segregated waste, uh, transport it, uh, do some kind of secondary segregation and then ensure off-site kind of treatment for it, where we're looking at these kind of more centralized systems. Now, on-site solutions becomes quite important in the Indian context because uh, under many government initiatives, especially in rural India, schools are a big focus for menstrual health education and uh, uh, fat distribution. And therefore, we are looking, especially in rural India, for feasible, safe, and effective on-site solutions. So let's dig into this a little more. Um, the first thing which I always like to talk about uh, is dustbins. Dustbins are really important. Dustbins, disposal shoots. And here's why. For any user who's using a product who wants to throw it, they need to have a place to throw it. Dr. Richard showed a, a slide with pictures of how, um, how people here, how people who menstruate are disposing their materials. And an and, and, uh, um, a fair proportion, but mostly a uh, urban po uh, population are disposing it off in dustbins. Um, but this is something that we do need to focus on because it's the first step when we're looking at waste management. Now, I like to look at dustbins because I think it says a lot about, um, uh, about the kind of uh, basic facilities that people need. So here are some pictures from my own field sites uh, where I've, I've, I've been looking at this particular issue. There's one picture over here of a dustbin that's parked on the ground. It doesn't have a lid. And one issue that we see is while there's a pad thrown in there, it's very uncomfortable for other users to see a used discarded pad. Uh, and especially in school settings, girls don't like to do this. I know of plenty of girls who actually tuck it into their uniform or into their salwar and bring it home because they don't want the next girl who goes into the toilet stall to see that, oh, she's 
thrown a pan or thrown a cloth. Um, now, what I've seen as an interim temporary solution, especially when you don't have much money and you have to do things at scale, is to take a regular 20 rupee wala dustbin and to wall mount it. You put it on a wall and you, and you nail it to the wall at a particular height. So this prevents rats and dogs and cats from getting to the dustbin and retrieving those materials. It also keeps it out beyond the eyesight level of other users of that toilet facility. So while not a perfect solution, it's actually a, uh, it's a compromise, but a more feasible compromise when you're looking at, you know, very low cost dustbins. Now, the second thing which I've realized is that dustbin lids make a big difference. It allows for that kind of discrete disposal of menstrual waste, but not all types of lids work. So if you look at this green, big green dustbin here, it's taken from a public toilet. Um, and as you can see by the dust, very few people have actually opened this dustbin. Now I've opened this dustbin and I didn't find any menstrual waste because women, girls don't like to touch a dustbin's lid, open it and discard waste. We don't want to contaminate our hands. So this becomes a problem. What we've seen work better, especially in schools, community toilets, public toilets, are the swing lid dustbins where the amount of contact is less. Um, and in that red dustbin over there, I've actually found discarded pads and even discarded cloth uh, pads that have been used for periods. Now below, you can see this is taken outside uh, an ashram shala, which is a tribal residential school that are prevalent in many states. And again, here they've got a swing lid dustbin and, and girls are more comfortable using this, provides them that privacy, but it's also relatively touch free. Um, now, we also have pedal operated dustbins, whether plastic or steel in India, but these pedals often break down. So until we find a better solution for that, um, we'll have to stick with perhaps the swing lid dustbins. Now, the second level is on ensuring that we're able to segregate waste at source that will then help us better with the downstream processing. Dr. Richards already pointed out um, uh, the Swatch initiative that's happening in Pune, where for over a decade, um, uh, waste workers and the municipal corporation and of course what's the cooperative have been working hand in hand to get residents to segregate their menstrual waste and diapers from other domestic household waste and to wrap it in paper and to market with a red dot. It's called the red dot campaign. Now this has been a great initiative. It has resulted in change though it has taken a while and we've seen this kind of effort being replicated in large cities like Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad as well. Now, the picture on the top is how this very model has been taken to a rural area. This is from uh, the Kanker district, which I had visited. And here, for the past two years, the Swachagrahi Didis have been, they go on their cycles, they've got their, you know, wet waste and dry waste collection dabbas. And recently, they've added another tin dabba where they can collect the uh, se segregated menstrual waste as well. So we know that this model can be applied in urban areas for sure. Uh, but also there are uh, feasible ways by which this can be replicated in rural areas. Uh, this is just a picture of how Bangalore Municipal Corporation has done their two bins and one bag model. And again here, segregated menstrual waste is collected. Dr. Rija mentioned about um, uh, the types of incinerators that we have. Uh, the most popular one for a lot of government initiatives tends to be the small on-site or decentralized uh, incinerator machines. These are fairly compact machines that can burn from anywhere between, say, five pads at a time up to 50 or even 100 pads at a time. So they can be this small to you know, larger machines, depending on the volume of waste that needs to be processed in that particular facility. Now, the issue, as Dr. Richard pointed out in India, is that um, we don't have any published standards uh, for these small scale compact on site incinerator systems, as opposed to the larger biomedical and hazardous waste incinerators, the CPCB does have overarching guidance. We lack the guidance for this. We don't know if they should be single chamber, they should be dual chamber. We do know that they don't operate at the high level of temperature required, as Dr. Richard pointed out, to uh, ensure that the release of toxic emissions is minimized to the extent possible. Um, we also don't know the safety mechanisms related to this. We know little about their electricity requirements, et cetera. What we do know a little bit from what we see the feedback from government and NGOs that have installed these machines is they operate for a while and then they break down due to various operations and maintenance issues, um, uh, inability to use them properly, 
um, also the kind of waste that is being provided in them, uh, as well as intermittent electricity supply. So there are a lot of considerations that we need to think through. Um, the good news is Bureau of Indian Standards is currently drafting standards for these compact small on-site incinerators, but we certainly need to ensure, um, I think, that the safety uh, and quality standards for them are maintained. Um, and, and this is often a, a bit of a, a task, especially since with the industry represented um, at these meetings and these decisions. Um, so just some other pictures. So this is the electric incinerator in a public toilet. So it has the uh, you know the vent pipe that is required. However, if you look at the other picture, the vent pipe doesn't lead outside the premises. It's releasing the fumes within the premises. We also see that this particular incinerator is uh, it was detached from the uh, the plug uh, because it was um, its electricity requirements were causing it to fuse for some reason. Um, and so there are a lot of issues when we're looking at these compact incinerators. And while they are one option, we need to figure out how to make them more stable and more sustainable and safer uh, machines for us to operate. Uh, there are some experiments happening with non-electric incinerators. So this is uh, one by Biomass Control, which is looking at the use of LPG um, for running it. However, currently in its prototype, it's quite expensive. It's over a lakh. Um, so there is need for more research to bring down the cost and, and have this as one particular option. There have been, again, some experiments in India on solar incinerators. Uh, this has been used with some success in the agricultural industry for agricultural waste, but menstrual waste presents a particular unique challenge as would waste from diapers and adult incontinence materials because of the moisture content. And there are some issues with solar incinerators being able to deal with this kind of waste that has high level of moisture content because 50% of our pads have about, it's got about 50% moisture content from research, you know. Um, now we also have, Dr. Richard pointed out that these other non-electric kind of incinerators. Now I wouldn't call these uh, incinerators. They are burning pots, burning chambers made of uh, matti, of, of terracotta, of uh, cement, brick, Tin, uh, and we see many, many forms of this all over rural India um, and um, in schools, especially where you find this. Now, these, I would consider them as interim solutions when nothing else exists. It allows for contained burning when open burning was the only option. Um, so moving forward, we need to consider how we can transform these into safer options, but as interim measures, they can be done following certain principles of ensuring safety and minimal hazard to those who are using them. Uh, sharing some examples of what I've seen government do. So uh, the government of Jharkhand under SBM Grameen uh, kind of developed uh, like a little bit of a categorization of the types of incinerators that may be required for public, community, and institutional settings. And the picture is uh, a concrete incinerator that is outside a girl's bathroom in a in a school. And this is kind of manual uh, manually fired. So they were using either kerosene, wood, uh, suke patte, newspaper, yeah, old exam papers, etc. to fuel that particular incinerator. Uh, in Uttar Pradesh, under the um, uh, under their Operation Kayakalp, which is a part of SBM as well as their Swach Vidyalaya program, they had installed an incinerator uh, with a disposal chute attached to one toilet uh, in the girls' uh, toilet complex, as you can see here. Um, and that incinerator had a particular design. It was made of a combination of brick, or concrete along with tin grates to allow for efficient burning. Um, the smokestack or the chimney had been was supposed to be built to a certain height to allow for safer disposal of emissions, et cetera. Um, so this is again another model with, when electric incinerators was considered not to be a feasible op option given the electricity, uh, intermittent electricity issues in the state. Now the government of Karnataka followed a very interesting process. Um, they uh, did a, a fairly kind of, I would say, robust and a systematic process whereby they uh, did a call for vendors who were making incinerators and they put them through, um, well, a fairly rigorous process of assessment that, you know, do these incinerators uh, meet certain standards and they collaborated with their state pollution control board and other departments to do this. Um, and from the pool of vendors that they received, 
uh, or heard from uh, after the assessment, they were able to kind of shortlist a certain number. And then these were the ones that were passed down to the Gram Panchayat that they could procure from. So doing after doing all this vetting procurement process, they gave that list of five to six vendors to the Gram Panchayats and they could only procure incinerators from that. So if you have to provide incinerators, then um, this is one way to ensure that the incinerators that you are providing are of decent quality, especially if you're working with the state pollution control board to assure this. In Andhra Pradesh, we've seen another model. Uh, they have something called waste management shed. This is working at the gram panchayat level. Uh, and here is um, there is door-to-door -door collection of waste and segregated waste. All that waste is brought by the workers to a centralized shed where it undergoes further sorting for plastic waste, paper, you know, the wet waste. And the sanitary pads and diapers are then processed in a more centralized incinerator. It's another option. Um, Dr. Richard spoke about the central incinerator facilities. And while this does present a good option for us, we do need to think about the whole issue of collection, transportation, secondary uh, segregation before it goes into these incinerator facilities. Now, biomedical waste incinerators, we have about 200 odd incinerator facilities across the country. But then not all menstrual waste can, can, can lead to these centralized incinerator facilities. So perhaps there will be better options for urban areas. We we'll certainly have to think through how we can do this in rural areas. Um, we've also looked at deep burial and composting solutions. This is a deep burial design that we developed along with Miri a few years ago, and we've experimented with this. And this is basically um, to dig composting pits uh, that will allow pads to decompose. We cannot call this compost because this is done with regular pads which have that plastic content, but the decomposed materials can be used to line the next pit and you know aid the decomposition of the next set of uh, pads. Um, I've done some experiments in rural areas, so these are pictures from household uh, deep burial pits, which can be above ground or below ground at the household level. So these have been built behind the toilet. We've also done experiments with community level um, deep burial pits, as you can see over here. And I'm happy to provide more uh, details later. Uh, this is a deep burial pit that's been made in a residential school. Um, we have also seen some experiments with the use of vermicomposting, uh, which is the use of those tiger worms uh, that's often used for wet waste or kitchen waste. We've tried to apply that to menstrual waste as well. And um, experiments from Nepal who have been pioneering this particular technique, uh, their study has shown that vermicomposting works best with compostable pads, which are made of natural materials, as well as with pure cotton cloth pads. It doesn't work well with most of our commercial pads, synthetic cloth pads, and menstrual cups. Um, we've got a fantastic new innovation in India called Pad Care Labs, which is looking at recycling pads. And so it follows this process of having a dustbin and a deodorizer where you can put the pad that's collected and taken to a central uh, processing machine that uses a thermochemical treatment to separate the plastic, cellulose, and sap. And then the cellulose and plastic are then used, uh, uh, can, can potentially be recycled and used to make other kinds of products. And several, like, uh, several pilots of the Pad Care Labs technology are ongoing with different municipal corporations uh, across the country. Um, so there's a, there's a link here for videos if anyone's interested. There's also some global solutions that follow very similar technology that's happening. Um, I also find that sometimes it's good to look at uh, inviting calls for innovation. So this is something that I supported last year with, uh, uh, with the government of Telangana and the Telangana State Innovation Cell that looks at uh, entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurs um, and supporting innovations. And we did a statewide call for innovative solutions in the menstrual waste. And um, we came up with actually some pretty interesting design that can go for further, uh, that can be invested in for further research and development. So this is another option that ULBs can take or uh, with the support of Swachh Bharat Mission, we can look at creating such innovation hackathons. Um, Dr. Richa already talked about the importance of behavior change, and this is absolutely essential. It's for us to be able to consider waste segregation is important. We need to know why it's, it's important as well. Um, so I won't go into this, um, but essentially, I think education and awareness require certain points, and we need to figure out innovative, fun, uh, and, com and compelling ways by which we can do this. Um, uh, 
an issue which I think is, is critical, and again, we don't do enough work on this, is capacity building of waste workers and sanitation workers. They are an essential element when we're looking at waste management, including menstrual waste, given the, their own health risks and health hazards. So we need to look at building their capacities and also ensuring their safety, dignity, and rights as waste workers. And when they're dealing with all this type of waste and including menstrual waste. Um, I want to highlight that there are some municipal corporations that are beginning to think about this. Last year, I had the opportunity to support the Patna Municipal Corporation to think through um, their strategy for menstrual waste management for Patna City and how it feeds into the larger plan of the ULB to deal with solid waste and where those intersections could be. So plans like this are possible to do with other ULBs as well. So I'll stop here. Um, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them over chat uh, and, uh, and later as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Arundhati. Actually, we have requested the participants to post their question in Q&A or in the chat box. So once we're done with the sessions, we, we can take the questions. I hope it's, it's fine with you. Uh, Thanks, now I would like to invite our second speaker, uh, Devika. Uh, let me introduce Devika with all of you. Uh, Devika Jaisal is an alumni of IIT Gandhinagar and graduate in international relations from Central University of Kerala. Presently, she's associated with GIZ as a consultant in waste management to the state of Kerala in the project called Circular Economic Solutions, Preventing Marine Litter in Ecosystems. She is also working as a resource person and MHM educator for five years. Uh, she has received ISV Social Volunteer Award 2020 as a social change maker satisfying the UN SDG goals. Uh, she's a coordinator and the project partner in declaring uh, Muhammad as the first ever synthetic pad free village panchayat in India. And uh, now she has initiated her new venture called MH Square Menstrual Hygiene Hub. With this, I would like to invite Devika to please share her experience. Devika, would you like me to share the presentation and or you will be sharing it at your end? I mean, if your network is poor, I can share it at my end. Uh, yes, Richard, please. Yeah. yeah. Let yeah, me share, share my screen. Yeah. I hope it is visible. Give an intro before that, yeah. So thank you so much and uh, a very pleasant good afternoon, everyone. And it was lovely listening to you, uh, Dr. Arindati and Rucha, yeah. So uh, I, I'm very thankful for CSC for initiating this kind of a platform, especially on this very special day, menstrual hygiene. So yes, now uh, we had uh, like discussed about the uh, kind of uh, collection mechanisms and the disposal mechanisms and even the regulatory framework and the chemical compositions of the so-called like uh, sanitary, synthetic sanitary paths that we are having. Uh, so uh, these discussions are a kind of a, like a uh, through decades or for like since uh, years, we can say that these discussions are there on the platforms and many states are even just started discussing about these topics. But we need to like uh, have a kind of idea about that. Menstruation is not something which is confined only to the uh, type of uh, product that we are using or particularly to the stigma or on the waste management. It is completely correlated and it is having like different angles or different dimensions that we need to discuss. Because like each year we can see that uh, we are facing like additions and technological innovations every year we are having on the waste management system and especially in handling like electronic plastic and bio waste but at the same time we can say that uh, menstrual waste has not been like categorized under any of this section and it is rarely even like uh, having the attention or we are rarely focused on dealing with this kind of like sanitary waste even in uh, so-called like state level our national level conferences only very recently we started discussing by understanding about the intensity of uh, these issues so here already a gap has been created so we need to really work on networking about these issues about identifying the re real issue finding solution for that it is not short term but uh, a kind of like long term one and earlier time we all know that we are completely like uh, discussing on uh, or we are completely focusing on the use of the uh, product that is a pretty product like uh, dry leaves or so kind of like clothes old clothes the people used to uh, use during their menstruation but after that we can 
like we can witness a kind of like transformation in the stage where they are completely using this synthetic sanitary napkins a kind of revolution we can see and there we are actually uh, having many positive aspects like it increases the mobility of the women the workforce and it actually reduces the school dropout rate so many like uh, new kinds of positive aspects we have witnessed but at the same time already like rich i explained about the chemical compositions the plastic content the microplastics and everything that the so called synthetic pads or hygienic pads they are having so the real question is whether these are like hygienic in uh, nature because we are believing that these are safe and hygienic and it is not harming us and it is also uh, these are the things which is claiming by the manufacturers or producers but at the same time the real question is whether it is hygienic and we already got the answer it is not so here we need to deal with then what is the real solution or why we need to concentrate on the alternative products like that so i will start with uh, um, the muhamma model where we have uh, implemented a kind of uh, model which can be uh, replicable to uh, other states according to the context and here after this work muhamma uh, it's a village uh, panchayat in alappi district of kerala so this has been declared as the uh, first ever synthetic pad free village uh, panchayat in india so uh, uh, if we can go to the next slide i think so this is actually uh, the incident which actually made us to uh, create a kind of a project like menstrual hygiene management because you can see that there uh, the end wrapped used pads are actually completely filled all over the backwaters because alappi is completely connected to the vembanad wetland conservation which are ramsu site and you can see that all the end wrapped pads are there and this was the canal cleaning initiative we had taken which has been taken place during that time and it was really a kind of like shameful incident for all of us because people used to throw these kind of like uh, like tons of uh, uh, used uh, pads which is unwrapped in nature and it was very difficult for us to take this and you can see like 8000 about 8000 menstruating women were there in muhamma uh, from the four wards and it's a village panchayat where already like these people were using 25% of them were using all clothes and 75 percentage were using the synthetic sanitary pads which we all are familiar with so these were the uh, context and uh, next slide and uh, this is actually a kind of like activity that uh, we have uh, done or as a summary of the complete model and when we reach the second stage itself we can say that 14 40 percentage of the women have completely shifted from the traditional approach to that of the alternative uh methods or alternative sustainable practices so here this was like a four stage process which actually took place uh with the efforts of especially the people who really act on the ground level so that is something which i really need to focus on that is the iec the effect of iec and also the behavioral change because here we started with the regular awareness classes campaigns and uh, also uh, with the collaboration with education departments environment and health department and there are like this asha workers then this uh, kudumbashri which is like a fuel uh, for the system of the decentralized waste management system in kerala so with their help and with uh, with the help of sgs we can say that we trained actually these people who are really need to interact with the households or the ground level local people because uh, as uh, dr anusati also pointed it is very uh, important or very significant that we need to train them we need to develop the capacity building of these people who really need to interact with the people at the ground level because they really need to uh, understand that what to speak and how to speak and to whom they need to address this issue so that is really important otherwise this kind of downward infiltration of all these policies all this knowledge become like irrelevant without focusing on these kind of activities and then we focused on the educational institutions and after all these sessions uh, with the iec activities like brochures pamphlets and to door to door uh, like uh, awareness uh, campaigns through this asha workers who is like accredited workers under the health department so with all these uh, people we have initiated these activities and finally uh like we uh, come to the point of like distribution of alternatives in the subsidized rate because that is something which we really need to focus on 
because whether we these are affordable to the people so we really focused on uh, those things and after that uh, towards the end uh, we can see like uh, around 65 to 70% of the women in that village uh, they started using these kind of uh, alternative sustainable practices and then we started taking a review about like how they feel when they use about this or what are the changes that they need to bring about and uh, this is something especially in the behavioral change this is something that is which should be communicated from door to door at the same time a communication through mouth to mouth which is very essential uh, for the uh, especially the village people next slide and this is the kind of stakeholder mapping that we have done and here uh, especially it is important uh, for the sgs the households the local community because these people really have a very significant role in making the kinds of effective social change that we all are insisting on or that we all are actually working towards next slide so uh, while talking about the alternatives i would like to focus on ma major uh, i mean the criteria or the focus line that we have to be kept in mind because it should be available to the people and it should be accessible to the people and it should be affordable to the people because we know that uh, these kind of alternative products like the cloth packs menstrual cups and everything these are available on online markets but it is not a uh, kind of uh, downward infiltration is not taking place in the right method or it is completely accessible sometimes only to the urban uh, population and many people are even not aware that they have these kinds of like varied choices or varied choices of menstrual products because as i uh, like initially pointed out that menstruation is completely equal to synthetic sanitary pads for few of them they are completely focusing on just only one product because they are unaware about all these products and their usages then how can we make a change just only focusing on the disposal methods or on the policy initiative so we need to make them aware about the different variety of choices which is alternative in nature which is sustainable in nature which is available to them and which is very important and we need to make sure that it is even affordable to them having good quality and to accessible to the village people also next slide so uh, this is like few of the alternative products that we just focused and in muhamma actually we gave, we have uh, distributed cloth pads which is of the two types and even menstrual cups and you have you can see about period panty uh, and also the compostable or the biodegradable pads so here i i would like to focus on the compostable or biodegradable pads because we can see that this green tag which we are giving to the products nowadays so a kind of alternative industry is thriving on that section also by simply giving a green tag so a quality check or a kind of standardization if we are forming or if you are framing uh, for all these products it will be really helpful even for the people and also to uh, to kind of like uh, segregate between which is having a good kind of quality or which is having a good kind of like the uh, uh, kind of composting mechanisms and everything because here most of the pads they are just simply giving like green tag and on the first layer the topmost cover we can say which which is using like water hyacinth or banana fiber or something and at the same time they can they are having like plastic coating so i'm not naming a particular company but yes there are there are uh, people who are just uh, thriving in the industry with just labeling it as a green tag which we should be like really uh, careful about that that's why really a kind of like standardization and quality check and proper monitoring system has to be initiated for these kind of alternative products next slide so this is just the comparison that we can have uh, between the so called uh, hygienic synthetic sanitary pads that we are using nowadays and with the alternative solutions because it is having environmental impact social impact and the durability which like everyone having like confusions about the durability of this products and also how cost effective it is and what is what are the like uh, kind of uh, contents of uh, these alternative pads or how it is different from that of the uh, synthetic or the plastic sanitary pad next slide. so 
so uh, while addressing about behavioral change this is something i really really need to address on here you can see the uh, sanitary or waste workers or in kerala we call them as the harita karma sena the green army itself so here the major issue is that these kinds of attitude or behavioral change it should be like two way process it should be like a two way process because in the project which i am associated with here which is related to marine litter in coastal ecosystem there there is no proper mechanism for the collection of the system and they are simply either burning it on their backyards or just throwing on the water bodies and this is creating like very immense issues on everything it is not on a particular issue but on everything and the people used to give these kinds of packs without wrapping inside the bio waste inside the food waste and these people really need to collect it with their bare hands without any gadgets or equipments for preventing from any infections like that and their behavior towards these people are like very really very bad and that is in the case of like the village and if we come to the urban area we know that we really used to flush these kind of like uh, pads inside the toilets and we can say that it is causing like clogging in the toilets and this drainage blockage we can see so here this man really need to enter into this drainage and needs to clean this process so this these people are like really one among us and also we need to like a sort of dignif dignified approach we need to give towards them because these are really the people who are working every day to make our life easier because like if these kind of waste are got stagnant in our house for just two or three days we will i mean we will tolerate the situation but if it after three or four days we know that how uh, terrible the situation will become so behavioral change should start from the people who deal with this and also the people who are giving them this waste they really need to segregate the waste at the source itself so that kind of an, uh, a behavioral change or an attitude change we need to develop and this is only uh, applicable or this this can be only done through kind of a consistent iec work consistent information and capacity building and awareness we need to give and this is not especially on very special days but it should be consistent with any policy or any projects next slide so this is one of the uh, pamphlets that we distributed in muhamma with a3 where i worked so um, here i need to focus on this model of the brochure because two three things i really need to point out which is very important in iec and which can directly and indirectly affect the behavioral change of the people that is here you can see it is in the local language so that is iec on the ground is very important so it should be applicable to the people it should be like uh convenient for the people to understand why we are actually giving them these kind of brochures or pamphlets we know that everyone is having very like busy schedules and all so if you are making like pamphlets or the 10 pages or 12 pages or booklets and all so there is some use for the things that we are doing especially in policy making or uh, kinds of like projects especially which has a very significant role in behavioral change and you can see that more images are there which they can connect with and also uh, the writings we can minimize the writings and we can include more images and the alternatives that we are providing and the issues that we, they will be facing so these kinds of things we can uh, like a kind of a coordination we can bring together like more pictures it can be in local languages and door to door we can give this and another thing i need to focus is that yes we all are discussing this in very good platforms conferences research papers and all but these issues uh, need to be discussed even in local committees local sabhas that is the gram sabha which addresses each issues of a village and also uh, like an agenda in the local committees or the eco clubs of the schools and of the villages or the corporations so this should be an agenda it's not only about the menstruation but it uh these kinds of things like the waste management issues the domestic violence like the sex education like different topics should be a kind of agenda in the local communities seminars awareness classes that we are uh, providing so that the ideas or the research papers that we are discussing in big platforms need to get infiltrated to these people also and we need to provide them a platform 
uh, to kind of uh, receive good solutions from these people because they are the people they are more connected to the local issues or they are directly becoming the witness of these issues and another thing is that menstruation is not something which is confined only to women so we need to understand that there are menstruating individuals from the trans community also so we should have a kind of like a holistic approach addressing each and every menstruating ind individual and uh, and also the people with uh, disability so they will be like uh, having kind of uh, double stigma or triple stigma we can say from the society other than this menstruation so that also has to be addressed as a separate part and another thing we need to make sure that in schools when we whenever we are uh, conducting awareness classes it should be a mixed class or a mixed platform whether both girls and boys should feel to speak about these kind of issues discuss about these kind of issues because usually there is a pattern during my school days also whenever they need to discuss about anything related to period or period culture or period practices there will be a separate session for all the girl students all the female teachers or female staff so that should not be encouraged we really need to work that we need to ensure that it should be a mixed class platforms where irrespective of gender religion social background everything we need to discuss about these kinds of platforms next slide so this is uh, during the declaration day of our uh, muhamma model next slide so uh, as a whole i just uh, done a kind of mapping where we can consolidate all the ideas by addressing the behavioral change and by addressing the um, kind of iec that we really need to work on because we need to understand the context of the area whether it is urban rural or what kinds of policies they or what kinds of disposal mechanisms that they are working on and we need to develop iec networking and everything according to that and it is really important that we need to map and consult with the right stakeholders and i'm so happy that i came to know from richa that already a state level consultation has been taken place in rajasthan and we are even planning for kerala too so that is really important because they really need to understand about the gap which is existing because we don't have a very solid database regarding this according to each state context and also how much waste it is generated on each state according to specific conditions what disposal mechanism uh, can be implemented according to the special specific condition so that kind of a discussion has to be encouraged and i see on work is uh, uh, ground is really important and another i need to uh, like specific uh, specifically i need to point out is that educating and then distributing the alternatives it is really important because we can say that from uh, the free day pass campaign of i think the menstrual hygiene uh, and mhm activity from uh, the state and central uh, guidelines we can say that there there were like installation of vending machines and uh, distribution of sanitary napkins and even now also our government is also focusing on distribution of this Uh, uh alternative uh, it's not i think it's not alternative but on sanitary pads and all uh, but we need we need to understand that educating them is really important because we need to educate them we need to make them aware about what are the real issues if you are using this and then how to use it we need to uh, educate them about using these product then distribute it so that is a real process or it it's like uh, a process which takes time because it is completely focusing on behavioral change so we need to be patient and we need to work on educating them about the product even they are using about it instead of like simply distributing it uh, on the other hand so it should go like parallel then uh, focusing on educational institutions also and other thing is creating working models because if we create a working models it can it can be replicated to other states or other communities and at the same time it can be an alternative livelihood options for this village women whenever they are setting up like unit cloth patch stitching units or whenever they are working this kind of social innovation labs within their village spaces it can be like a creative model at the same time an alternative uh, kind of uh, livelihood for this women 
so and very important is that on each steps or each stages we should have a consistent monitoring system to understand the faults and to review the process and also to review the output uh, and with which we can actually work on creating new models and so on. And especially uh, while implementing, while taking policy initiatives. So I just need to point out one example also, because here in this project, uh, which I'm working now, which I'm associated with the IIC. So here we can say that in ground level, all the coastal ecosystem, uh, we are providing uh, this app to the uh, HKS members, that is the uh, sanitary waste workers uh, for uh, identifying the waste, for uh, quantifying the waste, so they can use the QR code and they can scan and they will get every details about that. So this is actually the idea behind the app. So these kind of very innovative, you know, uh, I mean, technological things are coming uh, in the waste management sector. But we need to understand that here, especially the HKS from the coastal ecosystem, most of them are illiterate. And most of them even don't know how to use a smartphone or they are not having a phone. They are giving the contact number of their neighbor who is adjacent to their house. So this is the reality of the situation. So if you are taking this kind of an app, which is very kind of innovative thing to these people without understanding their capacity, then the use of these kind of an innovation is really questionable. So that's why we really need to, whenever we are applying these kind of things in policy level or in the technology, we need to understand that who are the people who really need to take this forward or who are going to implement this at the ground level and whether they are having adequate knowledge about this or whether they have the capacity to implement this at each stages. So then only this will work as a very collective model. And also we need to collab with different research institutions also to uh, receive kinds of like good ideas about this. Already we have like seen uh, different ideas and all. So uh, I just need to uh, wrap the entire uh, session uh, with the importance of uh, IAC and also with the importance of behavioral change, which is really, really needed along with the policy initiatives and along with the technological uh, innovative uh, technique that we are trying to implement to solve this disposal mechanisms. And I also request like everyone who is like uh, hearing all, I mean, listening to all this throughout the session to just uh, impart this knowledge, just share the knowledge or ideas that you are getting throughout the sessions because, and I even like request CSE to also to take these ideas forward because it is very usual that on very special occasions like uh, environmental day, like ocean day or menstrual hygiene day, we used to talk about these issues, creating awareness and all. But please don't make a pause after that. Just work on that, uh, move forward with that by collecting all the ideas along and to everyone to, who are like listening this, just understand your body. I mean, the process which is taking place in your body, that is very important. You need to understand about your body and you should you should be like, it, it, it needs to be a kind of individual choice on which product you need to use during your menstruation and make a complete awareness about that and use the product which is completely comfortable to you. Love your body and understand about your body because everyone's body is different. So uh, accept that and move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Devika. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your insightful thoughts about uh, this issue and also for sharing the Muhammad story. I think this is commendable. Congratulations to you. Uh, with this, I would like to open the floor for Q&A. Uh, if I may, please ask Dr. Arunjati and Dr. Uh, Devika to pick up the questions from the Q&A first, and then maybe we can move to the chat box. Um, so, uh, Richard, I have been trying to answer some of them. Let's just, I'll just go back. Okay. <clears throat> so I have answered some of them in the Q&A itself. So everyone should be able to access that. This is, this is great. Thank you, Dr. Arundhati. Um, uh, is there anything which is interesting for you and would you like to explain about elaborate about that issue? I think there was one question, the first question that came from, um, I think it was about 
how do we help the disabled person and how periods is linked with poverty uh, i found it really insightful if you could just uh, answer that question dr Rilith, yes sure i don't know if devika wants to take this uh, I've, I've oh yeah maybe devika. you or devika any one of you yeah but i have put in i actually worked on a paper um for uh, for persons with disabilities and what we can do with, uh, with a focus entirely on India. So I have put the link on this, but I'll also share it in the chat box so you can access it with talks about awareness, uh, product access, and the types of products that persons with different types of disability right from locomotor disabilities to intellectual disabilities, what they can use, the role of caregivers in supporting menstrual health and hygiene, um, so it is a very comprehensive paper with very practical tips from organizations that work directly with persons with disabilities. So that can be helpful. But I hand it over to Devika for her insight. Devika, do you have anything to say? I mean, about this? Uh, not, uh, not completely, but yes, uh, we need to focus on uh, kind of like the caretakers who are actually uh, give a kind of supportive role to these kind of people. So because uh, they should be completely aware about uh, the uh, kind of like the double stigma which these people are having and also about uh, the which kind of uh, complete product which is suitable for them according to their needs. So uh, it has to be like addressed from different angles, I guess because uh, they are facing, it's it's not something which is completely confined to a very particular thing because uh, they need to be comfortable with the products that they are using and also with the caretakers has to be equally responsible and also at the same time aware about uh, the uh, issue uh, that they are facing and also to the products that they are giving. And really we need to work on that. Yeah, thanks, Devika. Uh, so there are a few questions which I would like to read for you. Maybe if you can answer some of these. Uh, VCIUD is working on menstrual hygiene management at community uh, school in Nepal. Can you a little bit elaborate what is the best solution of managing you sanitary pads? So Nepal, yeah, yeah. Please Nepal is a bit. Nepal is a bit interesting because uh, Nepal has a. The policy is against incineration. Um, so the government of Nepal does not support it. So here's where in Nepal, I've got colleagues who've been looking at uh, the using of compostable pads. So in several schools, they've got the Anandi um, pad that is being distributed because that's certified as a compostable pad. Uh, and they're trying that route and then also making these compost pits and vermicomposting. So the, the slide that I showed you on vermicomposting, that's actually, that, that solution and technology is pioneered by an organization called HECAF in Nepal that works on environmental issues, biomedical waste as well. So they, through their experiments, they've realized that the vermicomposting works best on compostable pads, but not on your other regular commercial pads. And it works well with pure cotton, kapreka pad, you know, not with uh, we also have a lot of uh, reusable cloth pads that are made of microfiber and uh, synthetic materials. It doesn't work well with uh, vermicomposting. So these are alternatives because um, if you've got a policy regulation that does not support uh, incineration um, and the government of Nepal is trying to be more proactive, moving towards um, products that lend themselves to better disposal, then you have to be looking at this so that you can use things like vermicomposting, composting solutions, uh, et cetera. And of course, I think a solution like what we see with the Pat Care Lab solution in India can work, except that that requires volumes because it's a fairly expensive uh, technology. And so if you have volumes that works better, it cannot be for a single school. We don't have that technology that's at such a decentralized uh, level. Uh, uh, so there is one question which is related to this question. So, and this is from my side, uh, Dr. Arundhati, and I think we discussed this during our last uh, meeting in Jaipur, uh, where you were presenting virtually about the compostable uh, pads. Uh, and I think it's it's a good initiative that, you know, Nepal government is saying that you, you can't use incinerator plants, uh, which is a good thing. But at the same time, uh, is there any policy intervention in Nepal which is restricting the use of uh, 
disposable sanitary pads or the plastic sanitary pads because if there is plastics uh, compostable then the entire question about whether it is compostable plastic or non-compostable plastic you know will not make any sense because for that we need additional infrastructure we can't compost our sanitary pads along with our wet waste or biodegradable waste or the organic waste we need to have a separate infrastructure which is dealing only with uh, composting of the so-called compostable plants uh, i mean uh, pads and the other thing is uh, standards like uh, devika also mentioned about it i'm seeing a lot of uh, brands which are saying that they they are selling compostable plan, uh, pads but at the same time i actually don't know if they, their claim is right or wrong so i as a consumer or anybody how do we confirm that this particular uh, brand is selling a uh, a genuine product, a compostable pad or not? A really important question, which I think someone else also raised this issue of, you know, um, uh, on this whole thing of standard. So in India, we do have standards for disposable sanitary pads. We have standards for reusable uh, cloth pads and menstrual underwear, which uh, me and someone else were instrumental in facilitating these standards. Um, now, with the revised standards for disposable pads, we have a criteria now for compostability. So there is an ISO uh, that you can test against. So there is a particular criteria, you can test for it. The issue that we have here is because standards in India, whether BIS or CPCB are not mandatory. It is up to, so BIS will say it's up to central government. Central government will say it's up to states, you know, uh, to enforce it. It is, uh, they um, will say that we are not the enforcing agency. We are the agency that makes the standard. Now, the problem is um, when we don't enforce it, say through government procurement, um, and say that only those that meet BIS standards and meet BIS compostable standards will can be truly certified as compostable and be allowed to be in the commercial market or a part of government procurement and distribution efforts. This is something that we're in an uphill battle. And it's not an India problem alone. It is a problem that we're facing across the world um, about the enforcement of, of standards, especially in low and middle income countries. Now, Nepal, you asked about Nepal. Nepal standards have actually taken our BIS standards and they have drafted their standards according to us just a few years ago. Um, Nepal didn't have standards. I think they came in in 2017 or 2018. Um, and they took our, our standards and drafted theirs in, in accordance with that. Except that they, they've got a body that's trying to push, you know, safer alternatives, safer disposal, uh, etc. But for us in India, we need to crack this issue of how do we enforce standards. We have a lot of claims. Eco-friendly is not a technical term. Okay, um, it is not a technical term. It is not a criteria by which you can assess something. We need to have tests. We need to have uh, more laboratories that are NABL certified that can test these products and provide certification. Because the other issue that I see from manufacturers is they come to me and say, Kahan jai? you know, uh, or someone who's an innovator, who's a social enterprise, we don't have them. We don't have lakhs of rupees to test. What do we do? How do we do? They are trying hard to look at water hyacinth and hemp fiber, and they're really trying to be innovative, but they're startups. And, this, and even if they're winning competitions, that 10 lakhs that they get is not covering the cost of testing. You know, so we need to figure out ways by which enterprises, social enterprises, innovators have access to NABL certified labs where they can test their product to ensure that they are truly compostable uh, and that they have the minimal level of plastic that is required for them to be able to pass those tests. It's right now, today we're talking about plastics, but as you see in the toxic things report, there's also chemical additives, yeah, you know, yeah. which are which are included, whether it's scents, um, whether it's, you know, these pain relieving medication of sort, like we need to have standards to, to assess our products according to this, because these are very close to our body or inside our bodies. We need to know what's going inside because they can have pretty severe long-term health consequences not just from a treatment point of view, but from a usage point of view. True, absolutely true. So are you saying that we need to have a uniform certification system or maybe a sort of symbol which uh, is basically it can help the consumers to choose the right sort of material, but right now we do not have uh, such certification system on place. We don't have a certification 
uh, we need to have that just like what you have organic India others like we have for food yeah. products we need to have it for this we do have BIS we yeah. have the Bureau yeah. of Indian Standards so now we need to figure out the implementation part of it you know our issue I think you have said this right we've got great policies the implementation is a problem mm-hmm. how do we support that and how do we ensure greater access to labs that will allow and support the certification at a state level true absolutely um there's so many questions and we are actually it's 351 so i might take two or three uh devika you can take few questions which you feel you can uh, i mean it's i mean same holds true for <laughs> dr arunthi also there's so many i don't know how many we can pick yeah, yeah. there is one question by abhishek kumar how is segregation process happened with biodegradable and non biodegradable sanitary napkins in the waste management system i don't think we have such sub segregation system in place i'm curious to know this because i'm using biodegradable ones after a lot of research with the brands that claim they are expensive and not easily available in the market that's the mechanism uh, what's the mechanism uh, that's been followed when they all go into the same dump so there is no segre- sub segregation happening i mean of course there are right. cities which are being following four way to six way uh, segregation of the waste at source uh, uh, segregation i'm talking about but i've never came across any case study where they are segregating the uh, biodegradable and non biodegradable parts we are still in the very nascent stage where we are thinking to transition from you know making a switch from plastic parts to more greener option we still don't know even if all the women in india will start using compostable Pla- uh, pads mm-hmm. i'm not sure if we have a infrastructure in place to deal with you know with those many uh, uh, sanitary pads so we still have to think uh, about the options and how to make that switch because it is extremely important and it was really commendable they we got to see how did you manage to uh, i mean make that make that tra- make these uh, women aware about the you know the the ill impacts of using the disposable sanitary pads because i have seen even the educated women uh, like us you know it it takes a lot of time and efforts to uh, you know make them aware and uh, convince them that see this is not a good uh, solution and maybe you can use menstrual cups etc uh, there's there are many societal cultural taboos everybody wants a comfortable periods you know and we all are women and we will accept this so it's it's really difficult to make that behavioral change and the transition from uh, using a uh, non biodegradable plastic pads to something which which will have least impact i'll not say no impact because everything will have some impact on the nature but i think when we follow the uh, the pyramid of uh, integrated solid waste management reduction at the source is the first thing that comes in mind so reduction means if you are generating see if you are using a uh, disposable sanitary pads this i consider this as sup because you are just using it once and then tro- throwing it away even if it is it can be recycled right now the technologies are not used at you know at a larger scale that we are having such recycling plants and it's expensive also so for me it's just use and throw thing uh, but if we can minimize the quantum of waste maybe if we can switch to menstrual cup or something like that maybe we can where the durability of that material is more or for instance the uh, the cloth reusable cloth pads which you were mentioning about so yeah but yes we uh, right now we do not have any mechanism to seg- sub segregate biodegradable and non biodegradable napkins in india um uh, how are we going to access the slides so of course we i will upload all these presentation in the uh, in the web uh, in our csc website uh, so i will share the link um, with all of you Uh, what else we can take right now government bodies are recommending incinerator without any checks in place i think we have already discussed about this issue the people think by installing an incinerator all their problems of uh, sanitary waste will be eliminated why do you think uh, why do you think the environment impact is not discussed uh, in, uh, enough so dr arundhati would you like to take this question why do we think that the environment impact is not discussed enough do you think that uh, like incinerator so of course if for set when when it comes to sanitary waste or toxic waste as an environmentalist i also think that right now the most 
uh, appropriate thing to do is uh, centralize incineration of the sanitary uh, waste. Uh, but at the same time, you rightly mentioned that we are only having 208 biomedical incinerator facilities in the country. So uh, it's not even sufficient for the cities, forget about the, uh, the villages. Uh, so, uh, so the question is, why do we think that the environment impact is not? Do you think that it's 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 uh, whatever he's mentioning is right, or do we have to? Is it that we do not have much options available? Let's see, this is a tricky. It's a tricky question to answer, right? Because it's a um, it is an issue of there is a real need for menstrual products, um, and we have to ensure that people have access to their choice, right? We cannot push cups down everyone's throat. We cannot push cloths down everyone's throat. It has to be the choice of the person as to what they do. So we're going to see no matter what great work we do on cups and cloths and other new innovations that will come, the disposable sanitary pads will continue to be used by a bulk of people. You know, it's it's not going to go away. It's going to be there. If it's not pads, it's going to be diapers. Um, so we're, we're dealing with these kind of materials that are going to stay. Now about the environmental things, when we're trying to meet a need as India was trying to, that making sure that more girls, more women have access to these so-called safer product, then we were de dealing with how do we, um, you know, how do we treat this waste and how do we deal with this particular waste? Um, it's not, I, I think having worked with government, it's not that they don't care. It's just that they're trying to meet a need. And what I've found is many a time, they themselves are unaware of the, impact that inappropriate disposal and treatment mechanisms have. But once they are more educated and they're able to do something about it, they're trying to make a shift, you know, especially we've seen government of Kerala has been proactive in supporting the use of say menstrual cup, you know, and providing, um, you know, certain budgetary allocations to also provide them. However, just like we saw that with sanitary pads, many governments were just simply not aware that the usage of certain types of pads can be problematic down the road. Similarly, they may not be aware that the usage of certain types of incinerators may be problematic. And it's our job with those of us in the sector, technical experts, advocates, um, you know, we need to make sure that we are providing that education, creating greater awareness through webinars such as this, so that we can say that, okay, what are those alternatives? Government also plays a huge role in pushing for regulations. Let's not forget, they are the ones who are pushing for it. Government, whether central or state, can push their central pollution control boards, state pollution control boards, and other bodies to ensure that procurement of pads of incinerators is happening according to set standards. And when standards are lacking, push for those standards and ensure that they are enforced in some way. So I think they have an important role to play and they can play that role. But just as we talk about citizen awareness, we also have to educate us as stakeholders on these. Uh, issues of what is safe and what is unsafe. Thanks, Dr. Arundhati. I think the next question, Devika, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, uh, especially regarding that of incinerators, uh, because uh, as you already point out, like already we have uh, kind of uh, relevant and efficient policies, but we need to think about the implementation stage itself, because who really need to take about the responsibility in implementing these things? That is whether it is from which kind of regulatory framework, whether it is from the waste management sector or from the environment department or from uh, like CPCB or like from which uh, kind of entity or which kind of regulation that we really need to uh, make it effective for implementation on the ground level. That is who will take the responsibility of this. That is something really we need to discuss because we already have like kind of enough policies to make this workable. And also in the case of, uh, I will just mention about the Kerala where how it is working because we have a kind of like centralized incineration and uh, at the same time we have like decentralized incinerators, which is not even like working properly or uh, there maybe like without, uh, I mean, without meeting the criteria or the standards or the certifications and in the institutions and workplaces, we can say they are using burners instead and they are claiming it as they are the decentralized incinerators or the kinds of uh, incinerators which all the criteria that they are meeting but they are simply burners we can see in uh, educational institutions and all so again it is creating much more issues it is again adding fuel to the uh, issue or how it is affecting the environment and people are really especially the stakeholders or the uh, people who are working on this from the from the side of the educational departments and they're 
completely unaware about if simply we are putting burners in the toilets and all like how it is going to work so that kinds of like uh, criteria or differentiation regarding the centralized incinerators decentralized incinerators and what is actually a burner and what is the capacity or what is the impact it will create that kind of uh, education really we need to provide on and as you uh, mentioned even the educated women they are not ready to use like menstrual cups because they are really afraid about that and they don't know how to use it and it is not actually uh, kind of communicated well so we cannot distinguish between like village women are not aware about this or educated are more aware about that because still like i know people personally that they bought menstrual cups but still it is in their cupboards they are not using it so that is actually the reality of the uh, situation and as csc already conducted a kind of like study and there you rightly point out like the epr portal or like the regulatory framework we need to have a portal which actually uh kind of uh, examines or monitors uh, the kinds of waste generator the sales and marketing uh, which is provided by this manufacturers or producers about this pads and how it, it is uh, it is taking place so there we need to have a kind of like database regarding uh, the quantification of the waste which is generated so certainly i also like uh, agree with one of the question because we are less focusing on the environmental impact or uh, like it, it is only because of the uh, kinds of less awareness or the knowledge that we are having because we are not aware about the impact the intensity of the impact how it will co uh, create in the environment so that also need to be like worked out yeah yeah devika there, devika there is one more question for you um, the initiative in kerala is really good so this can come under sbm Uh, swachh bharat mission as the guidelines say or this has to be managed completely separately does the government departments at panchayat level or block level support these initiatives or have been funded by external entities or groups like uh, uh, giz so uh, this project was actually the initiative of a3 uh, it's an environmental research institute Uh, so uh, we have been working there for uh, like i think uh, since 5 years so we have been uh, collaborating with the panchayat uh, and uh, other block level panchayat even which is adjacent to muhamma uh, on the complete waste management and after that this actually just becomes a sub project under the waste management and finally like this becomes like the main project uh, under uh, a tree and under the panchayat so and also we uh, gave the subsidized uh, product uh, from the panchayat plan fund because there is a plan fund allocation for each panchayat and even for corporation in taking these kinds of activities like uh, kind of activities which is related to waste management which is related to iec which is related to the uh, health and educating this uh, local community so like plan fund allocations will be there for each panchayat and each corporation like municipal corporations so we actually may uh, uh, kind of like contacted a kind of like awareness among the ward members the secretaries and the panchayat presidents and all and after that uh, from their plan fund also and from the fund of atri also it was csr funding so from there also it was like a kind of collective uh, action uh, we we have done yeah yeah thank you so much devika i think now we have already we have uh... over short half an hour good half an hour so it's it's been one and half hour it's such an interesting uh, um discussion happening and i'm really overwhelmed to see at one point of time we were joined by more than 100 people we got more than 300 registrations but i was wondering if people could join today because it's sunday uh, but it's really nice and overwhelming to see that we were having more than 100 participants at one point of time but we have to close this because many of them are leaving now so i think uh, at max we can take two more questions so there is one uh, which is coming uh, to me as our municipality is actually treating used pa uh, pad collection as a separate waste all together or how so yes there are some municipalities some good uh, cities in 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 our country including indore as you all are aware about it which is practicing six waste segregation wet dry plastic waste e waste sanitary waste and uh, domestic hazardous waste we have cities like uh, surat we have gopal 
small city uh, called Karad in Maharashtra, uh, Pune, uh, then we have Goa. These cities are practicing very good source segregation, um, investing a lot in IC, DCC activities. And once they are getting segregated, source segregated sanitary waste, they're channelizing it to their nearest uh, biomedical waste incinerator plants. Um, then uh, in our hostel, we have incinerator installed, but when it works, bad order and air pollution is a main problem. And this is what we were discussing about that we need to these small scale in, uh, incinerators. Incinerators are really notorious uh, because we do not have any monitoring happening. Uh, we do not have monitoring criteria for that. So I think it's, it's a responsibility of the State Pollution Control Board to intervene and see if wherever these small scale incinerators are placed or installed, there has to be a regular monitoring happening. Also, there has to be a certification system, as uh, uh, Dr. Arundhati was mentioning, for compostable. The way we need a certification system for compostable pads, we also need that certification system for small-scale, locally-made incinerator plants. So we don't know at what temperature it is uh, operating. It, it, the company can claim that, oh, the temperature can go beyond 850 degrees Celsius, but we actually don't know because we are not measuring that. And the sensor, you know, they're using very low-cost uh, incinerator plants, which is... Uh, which at times can create a lot of uh, chronic impact uh, on the human health because sometimes it is, I have seen some, and I think uh, Dr. Arundhati was also mentioning about this vent system, if it is not properly designed, uh, then toilets are generally uh, closed spaces where, you know, you know that indoor air pollution uh, is a big problem uh, because there is no recirculation dispersal of the pollutants. The same thing can, can happen inside a closed uh, toilet complex also. So this is something that we need to, um, uh, you know, consider while making policies or while endorsing uh, things like decentralized incinerator plants. So with this, I would like to close this session. This is really very interesting and very insightful. Thanks to Dr. Arundhati Murli Dharan and uh, Ms. Devika Jeshal for, uh, you know, for accepting the request and being able to, uh, you know, um, give their precious time. Uh, I think this is just a start. Uh, this is just a beginning and we should keep on talking about these issues more. Uh, I got an overwhelming, uh, you know, a response from the audience. I think we are we are uh, streaming this on our social media platforms also, including LinkedIn, Facebook and uh, and what else? Twitter also. So, yeah, I think people are watching it uh, as there also. And I think this is an opportunity where we all can come together and talk about this very important issue. And we will continue to do, do this uh, later in the future also. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you all the participants for joining. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye.